Welcome to Authorization in Software, the podcast that explores everything you need to know about authorization. I'm your host, Damian Schenkelman, and in each episode, we'll dive deep into authorization with industry experts as they share their experiences and insights with you. If you're a software developer or just someone that's interested in the world of authorization in software in general, you are in the right place. Let's get started. My name is Damian Schenkelman, and today I'm chatting about how Workday approaches authorization with Jennifer Wong, Director of Product Management at Workday. Hey, Jennifer, it's great to have you here. Thank you. I'm so excited to be part of this. To get started, could you give our listeners a brief overview of your background? Sure. I've been with Workday for 10 years, and over the years, I've been leading product management across different platform solutions across Workday, from business processes, organization hierarchies, and most recently, security. What do I mean by platform solutions? Well, as Workday continues to grow and build new products and features, all these new products and features are built upon a common platform, reusing the same organization framework, the same business process framework, the same security framework, etc. This allows customers, our Workday customers, to utilize a single org structure, the same set of security groups, etc., to customize for the new products to their needs, which reduces their time from value to value creations and realization. With that background, I lead product management for application security with reusability in mind. We do not offer point solutions for our application. Workday offer applications and technology that work together to accelerate interoperability and business agility. That makes sense. We, we've had a few folks working on, on this platform, reusable component teams, uh, both from, from an infrastructure and, and a security perspective on the podcast talking about um, how they help their companies with authorization. Let's, let's start with the business and, and why. Um, why is authorization important at Workday? And, and what happens if it's not working properly? Workday stores the most important corporate data for some of the world's largest companies. This includes sensitive personal information about the former and current employees, contractors, applicants, etc. Additionally, Workday also stores financial information related to the company's past, current, and projected financial performance. Therefore, Workday operates with zero tolerance for stale security evaluation. If authentication authorization is not working properly in Workday, we are at risk of customer data being compromised. Yeah, I guess from what you're saying, you're storing a lot of very sensitive, important data. Uh, I also know that uh, Workday has multiple products uh, for financial management, human capital management, HCM, work adaptive planning, and it's from what I've seen uh, as a user, from what I've seen kind of like from the product, it's it's a very large surface area, feature and use case why. Um, how does authorization work across these different products? Is it centralized logic? Is it per product? Is it per feature? Yeah, as you mentioned, Workday offers a wide suite of solutions across HCM and finance, from the flagship application to many add-on SKUs. And in recent years, Workday has grown through acquisition, such as what you mentioned, adaptive planning, Pecan, Vinly, etc., to provide solutions that complement Workday's application. Now, when Workday evaluates each application for acquisitions, one of our key criteria is to ensure that these applications meet Workday security standards. This is because Workday upholds an industry-leading standard of security that has successfully earned our customers' trust over the years. And we want to ensure that level of security governance and oversight is consistently maintained across our current and newly acquired application. So depending on the application use cases and the authorization requirement for that, these applications then continue to utilize their original security model under the same rigorous security governance and oversight as all the Workday offerings, and we will continue to invest in our authorization capabilities across all our applications. It seems that, as, as you're saying, that there are things that Workday develop their acquisitions. I wonder how much of the evolution of these authorization capabilities was organic versus more maybe like intentional planning. Yeah, so our intention is always the same, which is to keep customer data secure. But as the company has evolved, our product and offerings have evolved as well. 
and the threat to the customer data has also evolved. So has so that our approach will also be evolving as well. And right now, we're focused on building additional security products and functionalities to facilitate security authorization between Workday suite of products. What are the the pros and, and cons of, of that approach of like having these different products and, and evolving them over time and, and also like having them use different logic depending on the application use cases? Yeah, the key advantage is that we can always ensure secure, customers' data is secure. And this is because, as I mentioned, we if, when we uh, evaluate these acquisitions, we're already assessing them with our standards. And we also maintain the consistent standards that Workday upholds after they join um, the Workday family. And in doing so, the customers continue to trust Workday and to store their most sensitive data and extend that trust they have with Workday to all our Workday applications. So that's a most key advantage. Now, in addition to that, we also leverage the fact that Workday applications and other applied applications are under the same company. So actually, we can collaborate much closer to enhance our joint customer security and experiences. For example, like every week, I meet with several of my counterparts in Adaptive, Pecan, etc., to explore and roadmap joint opportunities. Um, one I can share is last year, we delivered a just-in-time provisioning feature to support single sign-on for our joint customers who bought both Workday Strategic Sourcing, previously known as Scout, and Workday. So there are many opportunities by um, by leveraging what we can do together in uh, representing our Workday and the Workday uh, acquired acquisitions. Now, on the other hand, um, we also understand that every application may have its unique security requirements. For example, like granular accessibility is required for adaptive planning reports down to role level. So we acknowledge that there are no cookie cutter approach. And so we collaborate closely with our acquired application team to adapt, to adapt and adjust. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I, it goes back, I think, to, to some of what you're saying about whether like, what you do with each of these applications and, and whether you end up centralizing or not depends on the use cases. So, for example, again, granular accessibility is required for adaptive planning, maybe not for, for these other uh, products, and that likely requires very different technology and, and a different approach. And ultimately, what I heard a couple of times, it's it seems this is about trust, right? Authorization and, and trust go hand in hand. Definitely. I, I want to get a, a bit into how uh, the users and kind of like user roles and, and permissions work at Workday and where authorizations decision happen. Sure. Well, first and foremost, um, Workday follows core zero trust principles in all our authorization decisions by explicitly verifying the users for every single transactions and actions, and therefore enforcing the least privileged access. Now the system checks to see what the data elements the user is attempting to access and for whom, and then checks to see if the user has a security permission to access the requested data. So the basis of the evaluation relies upon three key things, the security domain, the security group, and the security policy. Now, let me dive into each of them a little bit. The security domain is a grouping of data elements and tasks, collectively known as security items. If you know Workday well, like it's more about the, the reports and tasks you see, like request PTO or, or view my payroll check, etc. Security groups are the groupings of the users based on their roles, jobs, or attributes. We provide both standard out-of-the-box security groups and customer configurable security groups. And both of them can be applied with contextual security. And finally, security policy. For each security domain where we group all those data elements and tasks, the policy uh, have, each domain have of the policy and the policy dictates which security group can perform what actions, view or modify. Yeah, that, that makes sense. You, you mentioned zero trust, which is, uh, I think, becoming uh... A hotter topic every year and I, I'm hearing that term more and more in the podcast as, as we talk to folks um I, I'd like to kind of like dig a bit deeper into some of these things like and and maybe again for as you mentioned like if you know word day but what about like if I, if I don't know word day who 
who manages these security domains and groups and and what their expertise needs to be, um, how do they maintain it? Are these uh, policies or rules code? Are they UI based? How does this work? Sure. So Workday customers have security administrators who configure and maintain Workday authorization settings for all their tenants, including the security groups and the security policies. And one thing I'm really proud of is that the Workday provides this easy to use UI interface for the security in administrators to set things up. And they, we do not need them to write code. And it's a very intuitive UI experience for them. We also provide rigorous approvals and auditing capabilities to ensure the security setup is meeting expectations. Um, and we talked about this a bit earlier when we gave that example of kind of like granular low level access, but but more kind of like general, right? Like how coarse grain are these roles and, and provisions? Um, and more, in, more importantly, like how do you make product decisions around this granularity? For example, uh, is it because customers require more or less of it? Is it a trade off between simplicity and clarity or like maybe less granular approaches versus the flexibility of, of finer grain authorization? Yeah, we actually at Workday offer uh, a, a, a range of options from uh, out of the box customer configurable groups to uh, Workday delivered groups. And I can touch upon each of them. So out of the box, we offer roles via the customer configurable security groups, which can be based on the users, the roles, the jobs, organization, many other things. They can be combined into new security groups that logically include or exclude other groups as well. And so combined with the predefined policies, they can grant or restrict user access. Um, customers can tailor these groups and policies to meet their needs, providing as fine grain access as they required to support any complex configurations they have. Now, um, over time, customers are requesting more and more granular security controls, and they need more constrained access to search and task. And so to address that, um, in the past uh, years, we have enhanced our security groups to provide a rule-based security concept. And this security group is actually, uh, we allow customers to further constrain the members on based on a baseline security group using condition rules. So for, if, let me illustrate it with an example so it's easier to understand. So um, we've heard use cases where customer want to only enable part-time workers to track their work hours in Workday. So Workday already has a Workday delivered security group. We call it all users. And this security group um, can be used as a baseline for this rule-based security group. Now, the next thing customers do is to define a security rule um, to say, what, how do you define what's a part-time worker? Well, in Workday, um, we have um, these fields like time type, et cetera, to help you identify these part-time workers. So you can create a security rule that narrows down to just a bunch of, uh, only to the uh, part-time workers. Then you can apply this security rule to the inclusion criteria of the rule-based security groups with all user security group as bases. So this means that we have, we grab all the users and then apply this rule so only it returns the part-time workers there. And then by adding this new rule-based security group we just created to the time tracking domain, um, which secures uh, the, um, uh, the uh, work hours, you can then enable only part-time workers to track their work hours. Now, Workday also provides security group that are automatically updated based on the business process, such as hire and end contract. And we have these Workday delivered groups to be used alone or in combination of other Workday delivered or custom created security groups to determine access via security policies. So you can see that we offer an area of choices based on how fine grain that the customers need to something out of the box to something where you can apply more finer rules to narrow down the uh, the scope and and access. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me see if if I understood. So again, you, you have let's the, the pre vague groups like in all users. Maybe you have a few other things that that you know customers use a lot. 
um, but you can essentially take a new, essentially create a new group and say, for example, who is a member of this new security group? Okay, so you take all of the users and then you say, from for the, for each of these users, check their in this case time type attribute. And if the time type attribute is something like part time, then they they would essentially become a member of, of that security group. And on, from that point o onwards, that customer can start using the part-time security loop in, in their uh, authorization logic. Is that how it works? Yes, that's how rule-based security group. Okay. And, and how are these kind of like security groups handled? Yeah. So at Workday, we have a lot of different kinds of security groups. Um, and they all are based on core things like the users, the roles, the job, and as you point out, we talked about in the previous example, like even attributes like time type, right? Now, the most common one that um, we we used is a role-based security group. Now, role-based security group is tied to roles that you create and assign to members of your organization. For example, a manager security group will be tied to the manager role for supervisory organizations. Now, why is role-based security group so popular? Because it maintains a rigorous security automatically when people change roles in the organization, which happens very constantly and it's a major pain point for security admins. For any mover joiners, leaders, like you have to edit all um, their uh, security, it's a pain. So the distinct design for workday assignable role concept is that the role is tied to a position, not the user. This means that when the user leaves the manager for uh, sorry leaves the manager role for the organization, the user immediately loses the manager security group membership. And when a new person takes over the position, he or she automatically inherits the manager role and subsequently the manager's security role membership. And so this removes the need for manually assigning roles and security groups for joiners, movers, leavers. Okay, there we go. I, I was, again, you mentioned that there are lots of ways in which people can become members of security groups and, and now we're, we're adding the notion of role, but it seems kind of like, I'm going to use a word, maybe it's not the word that you folks use, but like dynamism is a big part of it, right? So rather than saying the user is assigned to a role, in reality, a role exists, in, in this case, the manager role, and then all users that happen to have an attribute that in this case, might be um, they are a manager are assigned to it and, and that dynamism simplifies a lot of the management for folks that essentially have to manage the work they account exactly and so this is why this is why like role-based security group is so commonly used within our workday customers okay yeah that that makes sense uh, and it it's it seems intentional considering again the complexity of, of the domain and, and how roles changing and people moving and changing teams um, would make things simpler for, for an admin. Um, I, I want to kind of like switch topics a bit and, and maybe kind of like dig deep, deep into a concrete example. Uh, we, we use Workday at Okta. Uh, so let, let's say I, we pick a feature like employee comp compensation, right? Um, how does Workday handle authorization for, for that case? For example, how does Workday figure out who can view my information in the system. Yeah. So in Workday security evaluation that done at the time the transaction is executed. So say your HR partner logs into Workday and searches for you and click onto your worker profile page. Now, if you remember that profile page, you see a photo up there and on the left-hand side, the blue bar, you can see uh, there's a lot of tabs like your job, personal information, compensation. Actually, when we load that whole page up, we are already evaluating the person's security to determine which tab you have access to and to only show the tab that you do have access for. So in this case, going back to the HR partner, when the HR partner clicks and view your worker profile, we look for the security domain that secures the compensation tab and then look into the security policy for that domain. Within the policy, we can see which security groups have the view access, and we determine whether the HR partner is a member of any of those authorized security groups. If he or she is, we will load the compensation tab. And if not, he or she will not see the compensation tab at all. 
that's how it works. Okay, okay. So the in this case again, the the HR partner would need to be a member of one of the security groups that mm -hmm. has been con granted, let's say, read or or view access to to the compensation capabilities, and and that's essentially kind of like a dynamic check that happens at runtime each time the mm -hmm. the, the user wants to access this information. Um, I know it's it's kind of like sensitive and we're the big public company. So like as much as you can share, um, can you give us like a high level overview of the internal components and technologies that help with these authorization decisions? Sure. Um, a high level workday authorization architecture is in alignment with the workday architecture and leverages our native programming language called Expresso and REST APIs, caching techniques where applicable, and other algorithms are used for efficient evaluation. We also use advanced techniques such as dynamic prioritization caching to make the authorization process more relevant and efficient. And, and maybe, kind of like, can you give us an idea of the, the scale that the system manages, like the number of objects or, or documents um, the number of authorization decisions a minute or a second, like what's that like? You want to guess? <laughs> uh, I have I have no idea. Like I don't know if I have um, the notion of like how big that might be. It, it it probably like hundreds of millions or something like that. Well, much more, approximately. Like in just in fiscal year twenty three, twenty twenty three, around. Uh, 629 billion transactions were processed in Workday. So with all these transactions, every single of them requires multiple security evaluations on who can do what for whom or what. Um, so you can imagine the scale of our authorization framework supports. It's in the order of millions per hour. That's that's huge. Uh, it's and, and probably, as, 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 as you were saying, like the system that handles this needs to to be able to manage that scale every day consistently, right? That's that's very good. Um, wh where are these authorization decisions made? And and we typically like ask guests about this because of exactly of what I, we were discussing before, right? Performance and, and scale characteristics typically require handling large amounts of data, and that data has to kind of like essentially be put together to make these authorization decisions in like policy or an agent or software. Um, so what's, what data do you folks use and, and what's the performance like here? Yeah, I, I think you described very well that the performance is, is a concern, especially with the amount of data and the number of transactions we have. Well, the good thing is that Workday, with Workday, is that for all the customers who uses work, CM, Workday is usually the source of truth for all the data that you need for authorization. So we have the five, uh, five key things that we have, the user, so that you, we know the identity, the job, the position, everything about the user, because we uh, the customer uses work the HCM. We know the organization, the organization and hierarchy structures that controls the level of access and the roles. We talked a lot about the roles earlier, that the roles are groupings of people with specific permissions and responsibilities, and that they're that tied to positions which eases the maintenance for the uh, joiners mobile believers. And this and all these roles are tied to security groups. We also have all the resources, all the workday tasks and reports are part of the, uh, also housed in the same as all of these um, users, orgs and roles. And finally, so is the policy, the security domain and security policies that secures the resources. So with all of these natively maintained system of record um, all inside the house, our authorization decision doesn't need to go far anywhere but within Workday ourselves. And this is the core advantage why Workday can thrive on providing real-time security evaluation. And, and kind of like switching gears a bit, um, I, I know Workday integrates with lots of other uh, apps, B2E apps. How does a typical kind of like third-party app use Workday? Um, how does that integration work from, from an authorization perspective? Sure. So for customers who use Workday HCM, Workday is usually the source of truth, as I said, for the data that you need for authorization, like the user information, the organization. So therefore, 
a provides the API for downstream applications to timely update this data. I see, and and I understand also Workday does not do um, auth like uh, emit tokens to grant apps kind of like permissions to access resources on behalf of users. So how will do these integrations across apps work from an authorization perspective? Sure. So Workday uses a property object oriented role-based security access control model or RBAC that provides enormous customization and control for the end users on how they provision users, teams, and functional organizations. Then the customers or implementers can translate from our user roles to security tokens and scopes for various B2E use cases. These are custom integrations. Um, any data sharing between Workday and the external apps have to be explicitly implemented during using these integration tools, connectors, et cetera. Makes sense. So the the concepts that we talked about earlier, like the the policies and the rules and, and the security groups, you you have this kind of like proprietary machinery that allows these apps to integrate and essentially talk the, the Workday lingo so that they can interact with, with the API and, and make requests. Yes. Okay, that, that's that's awesome. Uh, thanks for, for explaining that. So we're, we're at the end of, of the show. Uh, I really appreciate your time and, and sharing all of these insights. Workday is, is a very interesting case. Uh, I really wanted to talk to, to you since we started the recording the season because of the complexity, the size, the, the M&A challenges. And, and I think, um, hopefully, you also think that we've done a good job. Reports to former CIA director, were issued to former CIA Definitely. former director John Brennan, really Susan Rice, security advisor, UN security advisor, UN ambassador, and former U.S. Ambassador Samantha. Other individuals, and also another thing for other individuals in the White House. Question, we're going to very read to get clear answers, to try to get clear answers. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Intelligence Committee will continue to review the information. And the House Int